So next I want to consider uh, another component of uh, ASC 7 load determination, and that is the importance factor. So to really appreciate the importance factor, what you first need to consider is how we generally calculate environmental loads on a structure. And in, by environmental loads, what I mean are loads that originate from the environment. These are loads such as uh, earthquake load, seismic load, uh, rain, snow, um, other lateral loads, loads that essentially are, that don't or originate from the structure itself, such as dead load, or don't originate from things that we can more easily predict, like live load, you know, the load of it's a lot easier to uh, perhaps manage live load in some cases than it is earthquake load, because at the end of the day, you can always put a sign out front of your building saying no more than, you know, 100 people inside or whatever the limit might be. You can control live load um, just with certain provisions and regulations and things. Just keep if you if uh, you want to be absolutely sure that your building won't go over a certain number of people, you can just not allow that many people in your building. However, when a hurricane comes uh, or an earthquake comes, we don't get to choose how strong that hurricane or earthquake is. That building is going to experience whatever it experiences. So the general uh, environmental uh, environmental loading process in ASC 7 is, and most codes is like this. So these are for these are really any loads that originate from nature. One, we're going to, uh, and this this isn't something you actually do in, des in the design process. This is baked into the provisions you'll find within the chapters of ASC 7. You do this when writing the code, not when applying the code. But the first thing you do is, for a given kind of failure, a given type of loading, you choose an acceptable risk. What do I mean by this? Well, you choose an acceptable level of risk. So you might choose... Uh, you might use a 2% annual probability of exceedance. In other words, um, you design a snow event or a storm event or, what, or a seismic event based on there being a 2% probability of that storm occurring in any given year, or you sometimes hear that referred to as a 50-year uh, storm, once every 50-year storm, even though it probably doesn't work really like that. But basically, you choose an acceptable level of risk, and based on that risk, you uh, determine a design event. And this design, and this design event it could be a storm, it could be a rainstorm, a snowstorm, a windstorm, a hurricane, it could be an earthquake, it could be whatever your environmental threat is. And so you're based on, um, you know, you're going to go back and look at historical data, you'll get past seismic data, you'll get past weather data, and you'll say, okay, based on whatever level of risk I chose here, here is what that 2% probability or 1% probability or 10th of a percent probability is. And then based on that, based on that design event, you will determine loads. And this is what produces your basic uh, wind seismic etc. values. However, uh, this is just look this this three step process is looking really just at the storm itself. It's not considering um, the consequences of failure in particular. So um, now, while we can predict just uh, if you look now from just pure base weather data and pro and structural properties, you can say okay this this is the based on a certain probability of failure or certain not the probability of failure, based on a certain exceedance probability, this is the level of wind force we expect to be applied to this structure. However, we actually want to have, uh, you know, as we've uh, advanced in the design, uh, as the field of structural engineering has advanced, we want to, we've uh, wanted to gain more and greater control of, uh, of, our, structural of, of our structural design uh, tools and methods. And moreover, we want to have a way of um, if you look here, there's really nothing in these three steps that relates to the structure itself, or more importantly, the use of the structure. So we want to consider the use or importance of the structure. Or importance of the structure.
So from a structural engineering point of view, from a pure, maybe from a, I should say from a, from a pure physics and math point of view, the use of a structure has no bearing on its performance. In other words, I could have, the, if the, if a building is uh, being, is used as a storage building or if it's used as a hospital, it doesn't, the, the building is going to physically respond, you know, in terms of just forces and accelerations and stresses and such. That just comes straight out of Newtonian physics. Like, physics doesn't care what we do with the building. However, we absolutely do. We care what happens to certain buildings based on how, uh, what we're using them for. In other words, there are some buildings that if they uh, suffer some catastrophic failure, like even a collapse, it's... It will be tragic and it will be undesired, of course, but it's not the end of the world. For example, if, if I have a, actually I do, I have a shed in my backyard. And if that shed falls over in a windstorm, um, I'm not going to be happy. I have some stuff in there I, I would rather not have crushed. Or actually, it's so light it might not even be crushed at all. But I have a shed in the backyard. And if that thing falls over in a, in a windstorm, well, I mean, it would be unpleasant. But nobody lives in that shed. Um, at if you were to uh, if you were to keep a log of the amount of time over a year that someone is physically in that shed, it would have to be less than one percent of one percent of one percent of the entire year. Because the only time anyone goes in that building, it, it's just a small little garden shed. This holds a few lawn tools and things like that. The only time anyone ever is in there is if they're just grabbing a piece of equipment or putting it back. And uh, so the odds of that narrow window lining up with a major rainstorm or windstorm are virtually nil. And uh, actually, even simpler than that, uh, if there's a major uh, storm event, we just won't use the garden shed. So if the garden shed falls over and it collapses, well, I'll have to replace it and that will be unpleasant. But nobody is going to be hurt by that shed falling over. So based on the, this principle of... Um, Based on this principle of consequences of failure, uh, the ASC 7 code has certain um, certain categories of building use, um, and we're going to discuss these here. All right, so there are four main categories, or I should just say there are four categories or uh, four categories of structure uh, that we're going to consider, and these are the four importance factors. Well, the four categories used to determine the importance factors. So before determining the importance factor for a building, the first step is to determine its category, its risk, its risk category, essentially, or its importance factor category. First, we have category one. What are category one structures? These, oh, it would help if I included the uh, number. Category one structures. These are those that have a low consequence of failure. Um, low, low failure consequence. And when we say consequence, again, we're mainly talking about in the context of human life and safety. So think of things like uh, storage buildings, uh, machinery storage, like machine sheds on farms, that kind of thing. Uh, Etc. So we're talking about places and buildings that usually just serve to keep, you know, oftentimes they're not even air conditioned and heated. They're just, they're just spaces that um, are typically used to store things. And if they if they fall over or collapse, it's again not uh, not, a, not not a desirable state, but it's not the end of the world. Category two. These are most ordinary structures. Or ordinary structures slash buildings. So these are your homes, offices, apartments. 
Now, I haven't explained what exactly we're going to do with these importance factors, but these are actually going to, uh, these categories are going to then be, once we have the category, we're going to use this category to then determine um, factors that will be applied to the actual environmental loads we calculate. And so, uh, so for the category one, this actually, this uh, importance factor will actually end up reducing the standard loads we apply to them. For category two, your factor is typically going to be just one. In other words, the, the, the environmental loads are calculated for ordinary structures, and then we scale them up or scale them down, depending on what type of importance we're looking at. So ordinary structures, so category two are just your plain ordinary structures. These are the structure, you know, 95% of the time you're going to be dealing with a category two structure. These are things like houses, offices, you know, simple factories, you know, uh, things like, things of that nature. Then you're going to have category three. These are more, um, they're not critical buildings for a community's survival, but they are, um, they do have a high consequence of failure because typically these are um, buildings where large numbers of people gather. These are buildings and by large number, um, typically I think of like greater than 300 people. Think stadiums, think, uh, Think movie theaters, think regular theaters, think large convention spaces, think uh, huge convention halls, things of that nature. These aren't uh, essential to the emergency function of a community like a hospital or something would be, but there's, they still have a tremendous potential loss of life if something terrible were to happen with them. You know, if a stadium falls over while it's full of, uh, you know, thousands of people, well, I don't know which, I don't know whether to say that would be better or worse than a hospital uh, collapsing, but um, in terms of emergency response, the community's emergency response capability will not be affected by a stadium collapsing, but it's still a major loss of life and, uh, you know, is an economically devastating community and et cetera, et cetera. We could talk all day about the, about the horrific side effects, horrific effects of something like that. But Category three, that's why they get their own category. They're buildings that um, represent a large loss of life if they fail, but they're not necessarily something that community safety fundamentally depends on them um, uh, surviving. But they do have, we will apply a greater loads to them than we will our category two structures. And then finally, we have the really important stuff. We have category four. And these represent two types of structures or two types of buildings. You have mainly your emergency services. So think police stations, fire stations, hospitals. Uh, also think about um, things like uh, emergency evacuation sites. Some communities in Areas where tornadoes are common will have uh, community tornado shelters, places where people can sh uh, can shelter during a tornado or during hurricanes or whatever it might be. And the last thing you want is your emergency shelter collapsing during that emergency. It's not really doing its job as an emergency shelter if it's collapsing during that emergency. So that's the first uh, that's the first big block of things in category four. And the other things, the other category, oh, how should I describe this? Is um, if I want to sound dramatic, I could say those things which should never, which can never be let out. <laughs> the dangerous stuff. The real dangerous stuff. Are you designing the dome for a nuclear power plant? It's going to be a category four. Are you uh, building contain a building facility to contain literal toxic waste? It's a category four. In other words, if you are, are you are you uh, building a uh, I don't know a uh, like a highly infectious disease research facility that is also probably going to be a category four. In other words, anything that absolutely positively must be contained within this building. In other words, if there is something that poses a danger to a community, but by it getting out in some way, that's going to be a category four. So basically, category four are things that either um, are needed to keep people safe from danger, or that if the structure fails, they will create a major danger to the community. So um, these types of structures here are going to be the ones that have the most um, load magnification applied to them. 
uh, in terms of uh, our uh, risk categories, our importance categories. Um, and uh, we, we will then, uh, just after this, look at importance factors as well. So again, this is just the basic concept of importance factors. The first thing uh, when figuring out importance factors we have to do, or the, when figuring out importance factors, first thing we have to do is figure out what category we're in. And then based upon that, we can then consult uh, ASC 7 and determine the actual uh, importance factor for a given type of category and for a given type of loading. Now, once you have your risk category, category one, two, three, or four that we just discussed, you can then go to table 1.5-2 in, um, in the ASC 716 or, or later edition and find what actual factor you're going to apply. So you notice uh, the higher you go, the higher the factors get. Um, and notice as well that we have different factors that apply to different types of loading. So, um, you know, and uh, so we have one, so one set of factors for snow, one for ice, one for uh, uh, ice with wind, and then we also have uh, seismic as well. So um, these importance factors are then referenced in the individual sections where you calculate wind and seismic and snow load, etc. Um, but they're basically, but again, they're simply the combination of the uh, risk category and the uh, type of loading that you're dealing with. And notice also that these only relate to, um, again, note that these only apply to environmental loadings. We don't tend to see these for, um, we don't use uh, uh, importance factors like these for live load and dead load, simply because we already consider that when um, calculating them, especially live load. For example, uh, previously we talked about calculating live load and finding a table values and things, and how there are different values for, um, you know, classrooms and hallways and that sort of thing. Well, those uses already have a very easy way of baking the importance into account. In other words, uh, there will be a section in there for hospitals. And so you don't need a separate, uh, you don't need a separate um, importance factor for live load of hospitals because there's already a category for hospitals in the original live load values. But for the environmental loads, which are just applied by the environment onto the structure, that is where we go and actually apply these important fa these importance factors. All right, that'll do it for now. I just wanted to show you a bit about uh, importance factors. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And as always, thank you.